We're going to begin this morning by singing hallelujah. That his love is amazing. So let's sing together. Hallelujah. 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 together this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you. 
Lord, we gather in this place. Lord, we sing that our hope should be built on nothing less than the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, this morning I would pray for all the people who are here this morning. Lord, that we would be able to truly say in our hearts that our hope is built, that on Christ the solid rock we stand, because we recognize that apart from you, Lord, we are on shifting sand. Lord, that we are in a bad place. So, Lord, I would pray in this moment, in this quiet of the building right now, Lord, that you would stir in our hearts a necessity for your gospel, for the word of God. And, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who does not have the foundation of Christ in them, Lord, that you would speak to them this morning. Because, Lord, we want to glorify our God with our very lives today. So in this quiet moment, I would encourage you just to spend a couple moments preparing your hearts, however you need to do it. Speak to God, spend some time in personal prayer, but as we begin this morning together in worship, I would ask that our hearts would be drawn closer to Christ. So, Lord, we ask that in this quiet moment, Lord, that you would speak to us.
we can say, do we trust Jesus or do we just say that we trust Jesus?
So you had a bad day When nothing went right You try to put on a smile And fight the good fight Well I got news for you And I know that it's true Jesus cares for your soul And he's waiting for you So trust in the Lord No matter what comes He'll carry you through No need to be blue He'll come through Say I don't understand All the things I've been through And it just don't seem fair What am I supposed to do? Will the answer my friend Ain't blowing in the wind The Father loves you So just come to Him So trust in the Lord No matter what comes He'll carry trust him precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that he is with me will be with me till the end sing along with me Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him all and all Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Just not blowing in the wind. <laughs> I, I like Bob Dylan. It's <laughs> you did that for me. That's a Denny original right there. My goodness. I don't even, I don't even feel like I need to preach after that. That's, that's so, so good. And, and Denny, you don't even know how rough this morning's been. Um, and, and so th- this morning, like, all right, the, the sermon is on not worrying. And, uh, you know, trust, trusting Christ, and, and, and it's easy to, to sing that, maybe, or, or, or say that, or, or preach that, when everything is going good. You know, it's sometimes hard. It gets harder to, to sing that, and to say that, and to preach that, uh, when... When things are not going as well as, as you would like. And so let me just let you in on a little insight into my life. And listen, this isn't so anybody feels bad for, for me. I'm not throwing a, a pity party up here or anything. I just, I just want to give you the background so you kind of uh, know where I'm coming from. 
Um, so, so yesterday, my, my beautiful bride who, who just takes care of so much of my world. You guys have a wife like that. She just, I mean, she just does it all. And, um, and so she, she gets sick. And, and the problem is, is when she gets sick, everything falls on me and I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. And, and so she gets sick, and um, there was, uh, and, and naturally she got sick because we were supposed to have a date night, right? I think she's just avoiding me. I don't know. But, but she gets sick, and we were supposed to have a date night. It was kids' night in. I love our children's ministry. They do such a great job loving on our kids. And um, I, I appreciate that so much that every once in a while, I, I don't even have to pay a babysitter. They take care of my kids for me, but... Um, Supposed to have a date night, it was kids' night in, and, and she gets sick, so I end up hanging out with Nathan Click all night, which, you know, it's not bad, but you're not near as pretty as Mandy. <laughs> and, um, well, you know, so that was okay. Um, now, now, preachers, here's what you, you need to know. Um, they're just like normal people, and, and they get set in their ways, and they like their routines. And um, so when she's sick and she can't take care of the boys in the morning, that all falls on me and, and all this stuff. So I, I had planned to get up early, come, make sure I had everything, you know, just ready to go and then go back home and get the kids on. So I get up at 530 this morning and I'm thinking, yes, all right, I got up on time. I'm, I'm getting ready to go. And Asher wakes up while I'm in the shower. I'm like, dude, you need to be sleeping for another two hours. Okay, because he's grumpy and he's, he's you know, having a, a, a go of things. And so finally, I just get him dressed and I, I go buy Dunkin' Donuts and I think as le- at least if I get him, you know, a good sugar high, they should be good, right? And uh, we bring him to church and they're destroying my office and all this other stuff. And I'm trying to figure out all, you know, what I, I'm supposed to figure out, print out things that aren't printing. I'm going and, and the prime time didn't print out right, which is a little bulletin insert where people can take notes. If you're a guest with us, you know, they, that we normally have this little insert in the bulletin and you're, you're supposed to be able to follow along and take notes. And, you know, the PowerPoint is supposed to be working. I hope it does. But the printer just did not want to do what I wanted it to do. If I wanted it to print diagonal, it probably would have. But it wasn't going to do what I wanted it to do this morning. And so here I am thinking, well, good grief, this is just not going my way. And, you know, there's donut all over my office and I spill coffee on my pants. I'm just, I'm just having a time of it. And then I look back at the sermon and it's, don't worry. All right. You know, God, I, I believe you're sovereign, you know. And, and as much as it's nice to say, you know, um, I got this. I can take care of this. The reality is, is most of life is outside my hands. All right? There's a, a lot that I, I can't control. I like to think I can. I like to think I can control my kids. I, I can't control that. I like to think I can tro- control my health. I, I can't control that. I like to think I could at least control a printer, but we know that didn't happen this morning. A lot of life is outside of my control. But it's not outside of God's control. He's sovereign. And even when I don't have this, I'm putting on my best George Lopez, you know, I got this kind of thing. I I don't. But he does. Let's read our scripture this morning. It's in Matthew chapter 6. We've been going through... We've been going through Jesus' uh, words in Matthew chapter 6, uh, well, 5, 6, and we'll be going into 7 after Easter, where, where it's the Sermon on the Mount. And, and they're kind of broken up into these, these little sermon bites that, that Jesus is giving to the, the people, the crowd that was surrounded at the base of this mountain, that are surrounded his feet. And all through this, we find Jesus speaking to the heart of people, and not just to the hearts of the people that were there, but to our hearts as well. If you'll open up to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 25. And when you get there, will you go ahead and stand as we read this passage this morning? Because this passage, more than ever, we need to recognize, you know what, this is God's word, right? It's not ours, it's God's word. So we're going to stand in honor of it. Jesus speaking to the crowd says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more 
than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? It says, O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father God, just in the last phrase of our passage this morning, I can give you a hearty amen. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And yet, yesterday was in your hands, and today is in your hands, and tomorrow is in your hands as well. Lord, I, I, it's so... I'm so prone to worry about small things, and I'm prone to worry about big things, and yet the reality is, is you hold all things, and you're powerful, you're strong, and yet you're tender and, and graceful hands. And I, Lord, I, I'm mystified by that. So I, I just pray this morning that your word would work in our hearts, but especially in mine, that we can sing and praise you at the end, saying, yes, it is indeed so sweet to trust in Jesus. I don't have it, but you do. Let your word resonate this morning with the hearers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at this passage, like I said this morning, it, it, it's, it kind of has welled up in me, and, and maybe you're going through a rough week or a rough time in your life, or, you know, the truth of the matter is, is even if you had a great week, we all know what it's like to worry. We all know what it's like to get stressed out. We all know what it's like to not be in control. We all know what it's like uh, to, to just be frustrated with the way that life is going, not happy with the circumstances that we're in. We, we all know what it's like to be anxious about things, and yet the Bible throughout it, from cover to cover, we hear God crying out to his people, that's us if we're in Christ Jesus, that he is in control, he is sovereign, he has this. Even when we want to say, God, I, I got this, I got this, I got this, you take this one maybe, but I'll, I'll take all of these, and we soon come to the realization that we don't have any of this, yet he has all of it. And so we're reminded in this passage as Jesus is speaking to the hearts of the people that are around him and speaking to our hearts this morning, he says to us, and one of my favorite verses, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Why is it that the Bible is so clear when Jesus is speaking and throughout the whole entirety of it that worry is something that doesn't please God? Well, for starters, as we look at our passage and we look at what the Bible has to say about worry, we find that worry is this. It is naturally self-focused. Worry is naturally self-focused. And this is so the antithesis of what we normally think about what it means to be self-focused. We normally think about somebody who is self-focused as a person who is haughty, who is proud, somebody who is vain, who is worried, thinking they're so great. That's how we normally think about somebody who is self-focused, and yet the antithesis of this can absolutely be true. 
the person who is just throwing that pity party, the person who is constantly saying, woe is me, look at me, isn't life so horrible for me? Is that not just as equally self-focused as the person who is saying, look how great I am? How about the person who is saying, well, I don't know about this, or I'm going to worry about this, or I'm anxious about this. It, it all comes back to us. And we know that who we are supposed to be, who we are created in Christ Jesus to be, is to, to glorify God and to enjoy Him completely. Our focus is supposed to be on our Heavenly Father, on our risen Savior, especially thinking about as Easter is coming. This is where our focus as, is supposed to be. And when we get look at this passage, we find where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The problem is, is that we're not looking Towards Christ, we're looking towards ourselves, And he realized that anxiety builds up because the closer we look at ourselves, the more we realize we don't got it. Worry is naturally self-focused. And this is not the life that we're supposed to live in Christ. Over and over and over again, the New Testament portrays a life that is not about us, that is all about Jesus. Galatians 2.20 reminds us Paul's words, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life that I live in my body, this life I live in the flesh is not mine, but it's Christ's. And then again, we have the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 9, 23, that we are supposed to deny ourselves daily, pick up our cross and follow after Jesus. In other words, on a daily basis, we are reminded as believers in Christ that life is not about you. That's hard. That's a hard pill for, to, for us to swallow. Because we live in a society that tells us all the time, it's all about us, don't we? We live in a, a society that tells us all the time that we're supposed to, you know, do the, the best we can for ourselves. Now, in Scripture, we are told to do the best we can as unto the Lord. But society says we're supposed to do the best we can for ourselves, for our own good, for our own glory. And that's not what we find in Scripture. In Scripture, we find that we are supposed to daily sacrifice ourselves so that Christ is seen. Colossians 3, 3 says it this way. If you have died, your life is now hidden in Christ. The problem with worry is worry points to me. Trust points to Jesus. So when we as believers, especially, and I am speak to the believers here this morning, when we as believers walk around throwing pity parties or talking about ourselves or simply worrying about what tomorrow brings, we are being stared at by a world that says they don't have it any better than, we, than I do. So our attitudes, our hearts, desire, and our direction needs to be corrected. Worry is naturally self-focused. Trust is supposed to be Jesus-focused. The next thing that we see in this passage is this, that worry is naturally faithless. Worry is naturally faithless. One of my favorite passages and my favorite books of the Bible is, is James. And in, in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, uh, James writes to the church, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But let him ask without doubting. Let him ask without doubting. Another word that you could very simply put it in there is, let him ask without worrying about whether it's going to come to fruition or not. Because the one who is worrying, the one who is doubting, the one who is faithless is like a person who is being driven, or a wave that is being driven and, and tossed by the wind. It says that person must not expect to get anything from God. When we look at worry, we find that it's naturally faithless. And not only is it faithless, but worry is naturally fruitless. And I think this is the biggest one that we all know is true, and yet 
for some reason we think by worrying we're going to change something. When the reality is, is worrying is naturally fruitless. In other words, when we worry, we are not fruitful and we cannot accomplish the mission of God. What does it mean as a believer to be fruitful? Well, Galatians, Paul writes us and says the the fruit of the Spirit are, are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self control. And yet, all of these things we see are canceled out in our lives as believers through anxiety and the worries of the world and the worries of today. Love. We look at love and we see that it's canceled out by worry. One, because we're not very, very loving if we're, if we're focused on ourselves. We can't focus on others. We can't love others if we're constantly focusing on ourselves. Joy. How many of you get more joy by worrying? Anybody? How about peace? Worry is a robber of peace in our lives. Patience. I can tell you one thing for certain this morning. I was not patient with my children as I was worrying about what was going to take place later. Do you find that to be true? Kindness. Worry makes us snippety with one another, not more kind towards one another. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Worry robs us of our joy, of our life in the Spirit, in Christ. Which is why when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and to the crowd that's at the bottom of the hill and to us as believers in worship this morning, he is telling us that worry does us absolutely no good. We will not accomplish the mission of God one iota by worrying. Finally, we'll look at it this way as a church. So we've been talking to you guys as individuals, as a church. Church, we will not accomplish the mission of God one little bit by worrying. We cannot worry about, you know, just, well, a lot of churches worry about what color the carpet is. We cannot worry about you know, well, this didn't go right, or that didn't go right, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. We can't focus on these things because we have a bigger mission that God has called us to. And if you're a part of this church, if you're united with with this church in membership, he has called you to do something. And worry focuses on all the wrong things. So we cannot carry out the mission of God if we're worrying. Here's a couple other things to be encouraged by. Now, I was told a long time ago that fear not was written in Scripture 365 days. When it sounds really nice, it's actually not there 365 days. It's there a little over 100 times. What we do find is that over and over again, the Bible tells us that we are not to fear. We are not to worry. We are to not be anxious. Think about what, was, what could not have been accomplished if these people were full of worry. What about Abraham, who left where he was from and traveled to where God was calling him to, and God repeatedly told him, do not fear, I'm going to take care of you. And Abraham trusted God, the book of Hebrews says, and it was counted to him as righteousness. What about Moses going before Pharaoh? Now, we see a person who was a little bit worried, but we see God also speaking into his life and saying, I'm going to be with you. Perhaps my favorite is Joshua and chapter 1, verse 8. God is speaking to Joshua as he's ready to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And he says, have I not commanded you? You should be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. And here it is for I will be with you. As we, as believers, come together, if we can just hold on to that one little part, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, then all the worry 
is for naught, right? Because Jesus is, is with us. So here's what we see in this passage this morning as we just break it down for just another minute. Worry is naturally self-focused. Worry is naturally faithless. Worry is naturally fruitless. But here's two things, and I'll put them together for you. Christ is sufficient, and Christ is faithful. Christ is sufficient, and Christ is faithful faithful. When we look at what the Word of God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The first thing that comes to my mind is the very first passage that I preached when I came to Clough, and it was in Colossians chapter 1. Because it was a reminder, I don't know if you guys can go back eight or nine months, but it was a reminder of where our focus needed to be. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes, and he reminds us of who Christ is. He says in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Right? Not we can hold all things together, but in Jesus all things hold together. And then it goes on and it says he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus himself reminds us That God is sovereign, he is in control over absolutely everything. In this simple statement where we read that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This is one of my favorite verses just to sit and pick on, especially when I'm talking to young believers, especially when I'm talking to young, young couples who are getting ready to get married, especially when I'm talking to youth who are getting ready to start looking for college and looking for spouses and looking for all these other things in life, jobs and all these things. Here is what the Word of God says to you. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. A lot of times we like to put caveats on this passage. We like to say, well, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, except when you're in love, right? Except when you're in love. It doesn't really matter who you married. God's happy. As long as you're in love, it's okay. That's not what scripture says. How about this? Seek ye first the the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, except when it comes to choosing the college that you're going to? Does it matter then? Here's what Scripture tells us. We're to seek Christ first in everything. We're to allow Him to be preeminent in all things. Do we not think that the person who created, and not just created, but sustains the world by the power of his hands, can also hold together the most minute little things in our life as well? Sometimes I think we just don't want to bother God with the little things. And yet we have a God who is personal and desires for us to take these little things, just even the most small things. We think they don't matter. He says, come to me. I'll take them. Not only is he sufficient to do so, but he is also faithful to do so. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says this, God, just in case there was any doubt, God is faithful. So no matter what you're going through in your life right now, 
we can take that to heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Maybe you want to underline it just to remind yourself of this truth. This is his word. It is true at all times, without a shadow of a doubt. He's writing to the church in Corinth. Paul writes to the church in Corinth. God is faithful. Maybe there's something in your life where you're not sure that God can handle it or, or maybe that God will handle it. And Paul writes to us this morning, says, God is faithful. He says, by whom you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Another one of my favorite ones is, is this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes to the church of Philippi and he says, And I am certain. Do you think that's definitive enough for you this morning? Paul writing to the church and says, And I am certain. Maybe this morning you're sitting as a believer in Christ and, and you're not sure that God's in control. Maybe you need to underline that word certain in Scripture as well in, first, in Philippians 1.6. And I am certain because Paul writes this to you. He says at this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That means what Jesus has started in you what Jesus began in you at the time where you first put your trust in him. That as long as you are living, he's not through with you yet. That he is still God, he is still in control, and you can still trust him today. Here's what I want you to know as we kind of think about this this morning. Oftentimes, we waste entirely too much time worrying about things that we cannot change. I think that's probably fairly true for most of us in the room this morning. Even for myself, naturally, honestly, now Mandy even gets mad at me sometimes because I, I don't worry about a lot. I don't, I don't get ruffled a whole lot. But even me, I, I oftentimes waste a lot of time worrying about things that I cannot change. How many nights have you laid in bed worrying about things that you couldn't do anything about? We worry about a future we cannot control. So church, and for those of you who don't know Jesus, here is the good news God is always, at all times, never failing, all sufficient, always in control. He is our sufficient protector, our provider, our helper, and our friend. And this doesn't mean that for us as Christians, everything's always going to be sunshine and rainbows, right? It, life's not always a bull of lucky charms, is it? But it does mean that we have a God, the creator and sustainer of all the universe, who promises to never leave us or forsake us. In the darkest times of our life, he is faithful, ever-present light that guides our way. He is our friend that sticks closer to a brother and walks along beside us. All of these things are ways that the word of God describes Jesus. So in all of these things, as believers, we find comfort in Christ. I read, this is one of my favorite hymns, and I think I read it the other day, just saying, when we find comfort in Christ, the words of the hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, echo in our hearts, that the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. And when we trust him, suddenly we're strengthened. When we trust him, suddenly we're refilled with everlasting hope. When we trust him, suddenly we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Suddenly our worries melt away. 
So this is the message that Christ is delivering to those who gathered at the bottom of the mountain. And this is the message that he has for you and for me this morning. There's a lot of things in this life that you can't control, that I can't control. But in all of these things, God is always in control. And so he speaks to our hearts this morning. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean this morning? Well, for starters, maybe you don't have peace. I have a a good friend that I got to have lunch with as I was up in Columbus this past week. And we were talking. He recently accepted Jesus into his life. And I said, Aaron, what... What happened that made you decide to finally give your life over to Christ? He said, over and over again, I kept on talking. You know, my, my life just wasn't going the way I wanted it. And over and over again, I, I kept on saying, you know, I, I, I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I don't have, I don't have hope. And finally, one day, his father just simply asked him and he said, What is it that you want? And Aaron said to his father, Dad, I I just want peace. His dad was able to share with him that peace comes through knowing Jesus. So maybe it's that simple for you this morning. Maybe this morning you're sitting here, the worries of the world are suffocating you. What you need to know this morning is that you can have peace too. Just like my friend Aaron found peace in Jesus, that same offer is good for you as well. That you can cast your cares on him. Another one of my favorite verses is when Jesus says this, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. He says, come to me. And I will give you rest. Do you need rest this morning? The promise continues and Jesus says this. He says, you can give me your burden and I will give you mine. And it's a good trade because my burden's light. Jesus says the the weight of the world that's on your shoulders right now, that who's going to take it off of you? And he replaces it with something that can give you joy and hope and peace. This morning as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation, I just want to invite you. I want to invite you this morning. We're going to have a couple of deacons that will be up here. And you can come and talk to one of us. If that burden that just seems overwhelming that you can't seem to get rid of, you can come talk to us. You can do like my friend Aaron did earlier this week and you can have peace. For the rest of you as as believers in Christ, I, I want you to know that, you know, worrying is robbing you of what God has given to you. Let's lay our worries back down at the foot of the cross. Let's walk out knowing that we have life and life abundantly in Christ. Whatever God's leading you to do this morning, I just want to invite you to come. Let's all stand together.
His presence.